Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 40 of Daffy's Roundtable. On today's episode, I'm joined by James of Top Shelf Geckos, and we're going to be talking about collared lizards. I get into why I wanted to discuss this species in the episode, but the second I saw them on James Booth at one of the expos, I immediately knew I wanted to do an episode on them. We get into collared lizard natural history, husbandry, and James's experiences keeping them. And we also discuss the scary Diversia agamarum. I probably did not pronounce that right. Where it comes from and what keepers should be doing to avoid exposing the reptiles to it. I'm super excited for you all to hear this episode. And I think there's a lot of really good information in this conversation for anyone keeping any type of arid agamid species. But before we do that, allow me to give a huge shout out and thank you to Exoterra for sponsoring the podcast and making this episode possible. Exoterra makes quality products for our pet reptiles to make them feel at home. Okay, let's get into it. Everybody, please help me welcome James Graham of Top Shelf Geckos. James, hello. Hello. Thank you so much for coming on. I'm happy I could be here. I'm very excited to do this episode. Um, I think... Um, we were talking, we, we, we've met at, just for to give people context, we've met at multiple expos now, and I always have to come to your booth and see the collared lizards because they're absolutely adorable. And, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's crazy how you can, you know, we were talking about it earlier as well. You can just, he opens the cage and they come hopping right into his hand and they know, as you, you, as you say, they know you're the cricket man um, yeah, yeah. or the food bringer. Uh, yeah. So I'm very excited. I'm excited to talk about them. But before we get into all that, um, can you tell us the uh, the chopped uh, top shelf gecko story? How you got started? How you got into the hobby and all of that? Yeah, so um, I feel like it's always typical. It's pretty typical for most people, you know. When you're a kid, I I feel like a lot of people say dinosaurs, but I was definitely a uh, I was definitely just catching everything when I was a kid, frogs, whatever, whatever. So I think eventually my parents just caved to letting me get a uh, a water dog uh, at the time, which is the the larval form of a tiger salamander. Awesome. Okay. Um, so that was like the, I was a kid. It was like the only thing they would let me have because uh, my mom looked at it as a fish and not as a, an amphibian. Yeah. So uh, I got, I got away with that. And that was kind of like my first um, keeping of an animal on my own, like uh, of taking care of an animal on my own and really taking responsibility for an animal. Cause uh, they were definitely just like hands off on that one. So, yeah. Um, and, and I think from there, it just, uh, we, we would go on vacations to, uh, the states a lot uh we'd go to myrtle beach uh went to florida and uh, all i did when on vacation they would be like hey you know let's go do this activity and i would just be catching lizards off the wall or <laughs> or being like can we go to the alligator farm again like that was cool like i always wanted to do those things so uh, animals were always a big part of my life um even when i was a kid i'd go up to my aunt's farm she taught me to ride horses like i i just any animal i just i I just love all animals. It's just a general love. Reptiles just happen to end up being my ultimate fascination. But uh, years went by, I didn't have any. And then uh, I, I moved in with a, a roommate actually, and he had a leopard gecko. Sweet. And, and uh, I, I was like, oh, like you, you have one of these like as a pet. And then I, I, I basically just went back to my room and I went on the internet and I was looking and I was like, oh, like people have, all of these things it's, like it's, there's, there's a so, possibility yeah like and and then i i think from there um i you know i kind of i did i did what a lot of the young guys do and i was like you know i, I fell in love with varanids monitors are they're super fascinating so it, you know it's hard not to be enticed by them when you first get into the hobby um but i think a lot of people can't handle that when they first start so i will give myself some credit uh i, I got a savannah monitor obviously it was wild caught because no one's breeding those very often yeah. um but i i gave him a, an eight foot by four foot enclosure with multiple levels so i did i did what i could for him awesome. and i think it, at least i started off in a a better place i feel than than most so uh yeah from there i just i kept I, you know i started going to reptile expos and i saw that there was there was people there that were just selling reptiles and i and and they were you know, there, it runs the gamut. There's good people and there's there's bad, but you can really tell when you speak to someone at an expo, they just, if, you know, you bring up a species that they keep, they just light up. And I was seeing that and I was just like, wow, some of these people are, are just doing this. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, I started just kind of, um, uh, the first thing I bred was, you know, bearded dragons, like a lot of people again. Um, and, uh, from there I just moved into the African fat tails actually. So I was, probably one of the people in the hobby that found what I really loved doing really quickly, uh, yeah. just because I got the African fat tails 
and I had great success with them um, in terms of having a, a very small amount of animals, um, but I still was able to produce a good amount of babies off of them, uh, which isn't super common in fat tails. They're not like leopard geckos. They tend to have a shorter season in terms of eggs. Okay. Um, and, and I was still producing like a, a good amount of babies. Um, and uh, I was kind of just in it when you didn't have to, ha there wasn't as many combinations of the morphs as there is now, because there's only a, a finite amount with the African fat tails. So even now I feel like compared to leopard geckos, there isn't that, oh, that much. Yeah, yeah it, it's definitely where I, I, I think it's basically like, if you really go with genes and not things that are lion bred, you're you're eight, eight or nine of them, right? Wow. There's, there's not many. So, but the combinations are cool. And I just, I, I enjoyed the gecko more. I've kept leopard geckos, um, but fat tails always just interest me more. So um, I think before I had actually even bred a fat tail though, um, I had knob tail geckos as well at that time. Cool. Uh, and I, the first gecko species that I bred was the, uh, the Nephorus levis levis, the smooth knob tail geckos. Are you still working with them? I'm not working with them any longer. No. Yeah. I, I, I really do like working with them. They're really cool species. Um, I just, there's a lot of people working with them now. And I think that, um, I don't have enough interest that I'd want to jump in it. And, and I really yeah. like the market to be a healthy thing. I want those animals to find homes. And when we all just start producing things cause we can, uh, it just, yeah, it's yeah. not a good, it's not a good place. So, yeah. and also focus uh, your energies on the things that you think need more attention. At the time. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The, the fat tails were, um, I just felt like I was doing good and I was, I loved every second of it. So, um, I've bred fat tails now for the past 10 years. So that was pretty much where, um, my reptile journeys picked up was the fat tails. I've helped other people with their collections, um, multiple friends. Um, also I've gone and helped them with their collections. Uh, so I basically, after, I think probably five years breeding the fat tails, doing some odd work, uh, and doing some web design, uh, I kind of, the fat tails kind of took over, um, as my primary. <laughs> cool. So, yeah. yeah, so I do, I do that. Um, and then from there, it, you know, it just turns into, I, I, I did love reptiles. I had a lot of experience keeping different species. So, uh, yeah, I sort of just ended up in a room like this yeah, yeah. It went from it went from top shelf geckos to sh top shelf everything <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah the name the name's not as fitting anymore but uh we've just been i've, I've been doing this uh for since i under that name i think since 2013 so it's just i i yeah. I, go, <laughs> I i sell under like daffy's reptiles and the majority of what I'm selling now is amphibians. So <laughs> I a hundred percent feel you. Yeah. Um, it's just, I mean, the, the thing is a, a lot of this industry is people just know you once you're, you're there, right. They, yeah, they, you, it's, it's faces. And, and I, I, I think that's a big thing. It's just the faces, right. It, it getting, showing that you are taking good care of your animals. The names, it's just a name. So yeah, I just, well, yeah, I thought about changing it. Um, my wife kept kind of spitballing the ideas like, Oh, what about this? And I just was like, no, I mean, I'm, I will I'll always breed African fat tails. Uh, I don't think I'll, I would never go down to having no fat tails. Um, yeah. I, I keep some fat tails just as pets. I, I, I don't know many breeders that would just be like, yeah, these are my pet fat tails. Like I, I just wouldn't, um, I don't want, it's not like I don't care about the others uh, health wise. They're just, they're animals I've had for long enough that I've either retired or they've become sentimental in some way that I, I wouldn't want to risk it. Um, so it, it's just, yeah, they're not more important. They're just, there's certain animals that you kind of just like sink into you when you've had them for a while. Yeah, you, you baby them more than the rest and, and yeah, you, kinda, you exactly. don't want to put them through the possibility of any risks or anything. Ex like exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We've got a couple of geckos that are special needs that we just, you know, there it was nothing bad enough that I wouldn't want them to live a full life. Uh, we have like a blind gecko here that we've had for, I think Cindy's about eight or nine years old now. And we just feed tong feeder when we're going through the you know the bins it's not a big deal to just you know yeah, give her a couple give her a couple crickets you know give her assistance i give her mealworms most of the time but uh i like varied diet and she can't catch the varied diet so i i try to help her out <laughs> yeah i know that's 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 awesome yeah and and respect for doing that uh cool okay so what are what else we, we we already i guess alluded to the fact that you're keeping multiple species but what else are you currently keeping or working uh, with? 
so I had to make a cheat sheet just so I didn't forget anyone. It's, <laughs> okay, it's, cool. it's just one of those things that you, you know, you list what you're keeping and then you walk in the room and you forgot someone and you just feel this guilt of, yeah, like, you oh. forgot like 10 things hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I just wanted, cause, uh, just to make sure I named anyone off. So as far as geckos go, uh, we breed the African fat tails, obviously. Um, we're working with, uh, Chihua geckos, uh, gargoyle geckos, uh, Lichianus geckos. Um, we have a pair of crested geckos. Um, I, I'm not a huge fan of, of crested geckos. My wife, uh, that's how she, we met through reptiles and she was a crested gecko breeder. Awesome. Um, and, uh, yeah, so she really likes them. So I do have a very, very nice red lily white and, uh, we'll probably only just produce off those because, uh, the market is a little oversaturated and I just like focusing on stuff that again, I feel is going to get a home that's going to really you know, appreciate it and, and give it that time. Not that the crusty gecko people don't, they're insane about their animals. It's yeah. just the, it's just that there's other species that are again, the forefront of what I'd rather making sure that we can get these animals to good homes is, is always my number one. Um, I I've got, uh, I've got one customer who uh, the past, uh, I've seen him the past few expos, but he's bought from me twice of collared lizards. And when I, when I'm selling to him, I know I'm selling to someone that is, you know, going to take care of that animal. I mean, you get that feeling and you, we can tell when we're, when we're selling at expos, it's very, you can tell who's, it's just so people, people light up differently. It's, I have been doing it long enough that you can just see that passion of, I want to keep this species over, um, what can I make off of this? Right. Right. And, and, and like you said, the, the light up, and I think they also, they're asking the right questions is like, a yes. very good, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The pe the people who who bring me, you know, like the, the, the like, can you come and show me like the exact lighting that you use? Yeah, they're like, I have lighting at home, but I want to know what you use, and I'll t I'll take them over to uh, Key Spooth Reptiles or us, yeah. and I'm always and I'm just like the special, you know, like they give, them, <laughs> <laughs> give them what I what I buy all the time, kind of thing. And they they awesome. always yeah they get them hooked up, so that's always like I know that they're going home with the right things. And most of the time they say they've already got them, but they still want what's what I'm using, right? They've yeah. seen the animal and they see how well it's doing. So they just want to make sure that they're going to keep on that track. And I, I love seeing that. That That is awesome. Yeah. So, okay. So yeah. So, uh, so I was at the Cresties. Yeah. So, um, other geckos, we have, uh, morning geckos. Um, they, I mean, if you have morning geckos, you know about morning geckos, they I have three uh, enclosures now. Yeah. <laughs> I've got two and uh, somehow one of them lives with my monkey tails. I don't know how it got in there. I think it was probably an egg on a piece of cork that I thought I washed. I didn't see the egg and it went in there. So uh, yeah, there's one running in there now that eats a lot of their mango. Yeah. Um, so uh, I've got a pet day gecko. I don't know if that counts. I just have a singular day gecko. She's of just, course. yeah, she's just, um, my friends were, were getting out of reptiles and they were like, look, this day gecko means a lot to us. Do you want it? And I, I, yeah, something they've always been really good people to me. So I just said, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not a big deal. I'll, I don't, I don't mind taking care of it. It's, yeah. you know, if it's you a have reptile. the space, why not? Yeah. I, and I've got the space. So yeah, it was, it, so she just hangs out. She's retired. She can just live her life eating all the bugs and all the Pangea that she wants. So <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, and then the last geckos that we would work with would be our, um, our Rachidacalus, uh, Trachyrhynchus trachycephalus, which are, uh, the lesser rough snouted geckos, which are, Ooh. um, a live bearing gecko from New Caledonia. Interesting. Yeah. Have you had so, any success with them? Uh, we had two stillborns this year, uh, and they only do the one birth a year. So, uh, that was unfortunate. Um, they did go through a move, uh, from my friend's place to my place at some point through, um, the pregnancy. So, um, yeah. So next year we just have high hopes. We have high hopes for it for next year. Cause fingers you know, crossed. I had no idea. Yeah. They, I'd heard of them, but I had no idea that they did, or that they like live, that they had live birth. Yeah. It's, it's cool. They're live bearers. That's the word. I, I, I yeah, I, I love live bears. That's, it's going to start becoming a theme as I list on. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. So go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so for skinks, uh, we have our, uh, two groups of pink tongue skinks. Uh, they are, not exactly sure of age. They were imports. They were really small when we got them. So, uh, I would say they're, they're probably a year and a half ish. So we still have a good amount of growing to do, but we're starting to be able to kind of figure out our ratios. So, um, they're looking good 
<laughs> that's awesome yeah yeah they're they're a really fun species to keep uh we keep three different species of uh blue tongues so we've got the uh the northerns uh we have tannin bars and then we have erian gyres I've heard of the northerns and the Irian uh, Jayas. I haven't heard of the one in the middle. That's, that's the, cool. the tannin bars, yeah, the tannin bars aren't as common. I don't think they're readily bred in captivity. There is people breeding them. I just don't think it's as common as the other two. Um, I know that uh, Great uh, Great Basin Cerbatarium in the States uh, has success with breeding them. Uh, but tan I think tannin bars are the coolest. They have the worst attitude out of any of the blue tongues that I've ever seen. But as far as colors go, they... They're cool. I have one that's just jet black. Okay, I have seen them. I was about to ask you, and then they sometimes get like orange stripes on them, kind of. Uh, no, some of uh, that's a that's an alpine, I believe. Um, okay. Tannin bars are like an Indonesian species. Uh, they're usually uh, tan <laughs> sometimes, uh, and then the, some of them will be like a grayish silver. And then um, my weird boy, who I haven't seen anyone like yet, is just pitch black. I, I haven't yet to see one like him. He's really cool. We have a couple of videos of him on the Instagram of him trying to eat me. We just call him Satan. He's <laughs> he's one of, he's one of the most beautiful skinks I've ever seen. But he knows it, so he's got the attitude. He's just yeah, yeah. The tree. Uh, and then uh, we've got a uh, the I oh I recently picked up some olive tree skinks at the last expo. Um, those are. From much, exotic addicts? Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, those are much more entertaining than I thought they would be. <laughs> so this tank that's right here um, yeah. is the Emerald Tree Skinks, and you yeah. may see them running around through the episode. They're very, very active. It's awesome. They don't, they don't stop. Yeah, they just don't, yeah. It's, I, I love it. I love, I love species like that. When stuff is moving, I'm like, you can see behind me. I think these guys, yeah, these guys over here. I, just I've starving. noticed them a couple of times. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. That's awesome. The more I've, I've as long as the movement isn't a stress movement, like, you know, glass dancing or things like that, if it's just exploring, I love seeing that because it means you're most likely doing something right. Yeah. Yeah. Are, are yours handleable yet? No, they're, I just got tiny little ones. They're, they they're will smaller be. than my pinky thing. Oh, I can already tell they, they're yeah. starting already to do the, like, come up to me when I come in with the food. And I'm just like, you guys, you've been here for like two weeks. <laughs> Very curious animals. It's awesome. Yeah. They are. Yeah. Yeah. I'm loving them. Uh, so then we also have uh, the last skinks, which I left to last because they're my favorite. Uh, we have two groups of monkey tail skinks. Yes. So those are uh, pro probably one of my favorite animals in the collection. The fat tails, the collards, and the monkey tails are, are definitely the special animals in my heart. Monkey tails uh, and the collards actually are both way more intelligent than I've seen anyone give them credit for. The, the, the recognition on on you being provider uh, so many of my reptiles are just flighty when i come in the room both of those species know they just they know immediately they also know where to go to, to wait for it so it's like you know it's that spot when you're feeding right they'll be right there yeah do, do they do you think they recognize you as an individual or do they just like are they smart enough to know you as you or do you think they just recognize that humans bring them food I don't know. I don't know. I don't like to, I, I don't like to say like, yeah, they know me because like, I I'm always holding a 32 ounce deli full of crickets. So <laughs> maybe, maybe they just know the deli, but, um, but yeah, I don't know. I'll have to do a test sometime. Uh, Brie doesn't really come in the collared lizard room. Much, so maybe I'll, I'll get her to go in with uh, my and deli. And, yeah. yeah, see what they happens. Differently. yeah. yeah. It's always something I'm interested in, in, in knowing too, because the Emerald tree skinks, I feel, um actually recognize I, I could be wrong and i also like you're it's it's not right to just say yeah they recognize me but when i'm in the room alone they're out and they're much easier to come out than when i like when somebody else is in the room when i have somebody else in the room with me they kind of uh, stay away a little bit more i would say that some of the only times i've been struck at by uh my monkey tails my my younger monkey tails my my older monkey tails um the female pretty much right now we think we think she's pregnant so she's just uh, she's just striking at anything that goes in there. But uh, my younger ones, the only time that they've ever gone at me in a way that wasn't, you know, let me come out and explore kind of thing was when uh, Brie was in the room. And oh, it's just, it, and but that could also just be, it's more going on, right? Sensory is, is very important to them. The different smells that are going on, the different sites that are going on, they're foreign to them. So two giants is probably much scarier than one, right? For sure, for sure. 
um, I'll, I'll keep on with my list so we can. <laughs> please do, please do. Yeah, so um, so we're keeping two species of dart frogs. We have the uh, the E. anthony, the Santa Isabel dart frogs. Um, they're kind of like the morning geckos of dart frogs, uh, but I, I've kept them for, I guess I've kept them now for like eight or nine years. So to me, some things are just like, um, part of part, not part of what I do, but it's just, they, I would feel weird not having them around that, you know, like hearing your, even your chirping in the background, you just get, I was going to say, those are the, uh, at the yeah, night chirping. Yeah. <laughs> you get used to hearing certain noises and it's almost like, um, a lot of the noises I think would irritate a lot of other people. Reptile keepers love people are always like, Oh, crickets. And I'm like, Oh man, that's so common. That's yeah. so calm. Crickets are out of the jungle. I mean, I mean, I had to move in the other room to do this, but but yeah. like usually, usually they're right out here, and yeah, it's calming. It's like it's a nice thing to hear, and the, yeah, trilling is is it, it's relaxing. So and 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 again, just watching dart frogs is amazing, right? Yeah, yeah, they're, they're uh, and then, and then the other one we have is the uh, these are breeze frog. Breeze doesn't keep many of the reptiles here. I I'm I'm caretaker, but. Uh, she, she gets me animals to caretake if she enjoys them. Yeah. And, and so we, um, they're a Migra Bassleri. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah. Cro Cro uh, we have a Chrome and a uh, Sissy Blue or Sissy cool. Blue. So, yeah. So I um, got those from Understory. They're obviously from Understory. So they're super healthy and they're beautiful. And um, yeah, the, I, I don't have any plants with those. Again, that's just something that we have here. Um, Cause we enjoy just for it. the enjoyment. Yeah, I, I do. I do. Yeah. I tend to, I, I really like, uh, that genus just, I like the rough look to all of them. I think they, you know, dart frogs all look so smooth. Like they're made out of like their little plastic figurines and those guys just have a rougher look. The bumpiness is more like yeah. a toad kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And they yeah. also have a beautiful call, by the way. I don't know if your yours are calling it, but mine have not started calling it. They have a no. beautiful call as well. That, that's good to know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I guess I'm out of that other, our other room now. So this, now I'm on to what's in this room what's that in this I'm room? sitting in currently. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so in, in this room, oh, sorry. No, I'm not done the other room. Uh, the last thing that we have in there is something that I used to keep uh, for a friend. And then um, he, he eventually took them back. So I don't didn't have my own. So I got uh, Gastrophobus brucina just because, again, it's something there's just. I want them. <laughs> they, I, I Like I said, I love I love animals that don't stop. I think when they're, those guys are so entertaining. Mini like, monitors. It, yeah, I was going to say, if you think you want a green tree monitor, you probably want one of these guys because yeah. these guys will come around to you much quicker. Yeah. They're, yeah. they're, and they're just so, they're just so entertaining. They're so, entertaining. every single one I've seen, <laughs> um, both in like just videos and in person, have like, you, it, it's a, it's sort of a look they give you, you know, and you, you're like, okay, you're, you're you're smarter than people are giving you credit for. Like you said earlier, they're yeah. you can see it in their eyes. They're like curious. Yeah, um, yeah. There's the second. I, I like I've only had mine now since the expo. Um, again, shout out to Exotic Addicts. We got those. Oh yeah, from okay, them. cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, they, yeah, they just they're they're already. I come in the room and they're just from the top of the enclosure to the bottom, just like, yeah. Just, <laughs> and and it also like I I don't um. Don't anger a Pristina, but if you ever do, it's possibly the best reptile threat pose I have ever seen. Have you Very seen one threat pose? Not, no. Okay. They'll they'll stand on their back legs and they'll flick their tongue out like Gene Simmons at you. <laughs> That's awesome. So it, yeah, I've I've only I've only seen it once, and it was because I didn't know. Uh, this was back when I used to keep them. Uh, I didn't know that I I had reached in where one was. I was trying to move a plant. And I think I, I I pulled his tail a bit, and he just flipped around, and and yeah, they stick their tongue out, just drop it down, and let it flap. It is the weirdest thing. <laughs> I have never even heard of that. That's very cool. Yeah. Uh, okay, so now I'm in this room. So uh, in this room, we keep our Euromastics and our collared lizards. Okay. So um, we keep two species of uh, Euromastics. Uh, we have the Euromastics ornata, the ornate Euromastics. Uh, and then uh, the Yemen Euromastics, which is uh, Euromastix Yemenensis. Um, awesome. So the ornates are, um, I'm not currently, I, I'm currently on the fence if I want to breed them or not. There's a lot of people who I would consider good breeders working with them. Uh, there's only a certain amount of homes that you can find for Euromastix every year. So um, 
I one of them hates me. Um, that's this one up in this tub. That's why she's in a Laguna tub, so she doesn't have to see me ever. Gives her a massive area to run around in and never has to see me, which she loves. Yeah. Uh, and then we have another one lower to the ground because she actually is very good uh, and she, she'll come right up to you, eat out of your hand, and she's awesome. So I like to keep them comfortable. If you don't want to see me, you don't have to see me. If yeah. You, if you if you want to see people, I'll interact with you. Uh, so we have those two species and then uh, the Yemenensis are kind of these guys over here. Um, they are, I would say they're one of the more timid Euromastics um, that I've kept. Uh, that being said, they're probably the most beautiful Euromastics in my opinion. Uh, the Thomasi are also really beautiful. The short stub tail guys uh, that get like a red stripe down their back. They're really cool. But um, yeah, these guys are just rainbows. They're, they're blue, they're orange, they're red. They're just... There, there's purples it's, it's they, crazy they don't get them as big as some of the other ones right they're they're a little bit smaller um but they're still going to be pretty big, pretty uh, big. most yeah most euro mastics have a decent size there is some that are smaller um i mean technically a thomas size smaller because it's tail if you're not including if you're including yeah. the tail it's it's barely a tail so but um yeah they, they're a little bit smaller i think it just in terms of overall body shape mine aren't as round as some other euro mastics i find them a little bit longer yeah. Uh the Euromastix Yemenensis too also have a um like an inverted tail. Uh if you were to take the tail and you know kind of hold it straight in front of you, uh you would see it's almost got like a, a U to it, like a, a U curve. Concave then so, words kind of thing. It, concave, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's that is the only Euromastix tail that's like that, I believe. So Interesting. I mean, it's not yeah, it's not like a crazy feature. That wasn't what drew me to them. It was definitely um I, I've always liked Euromastics. We're obviously big on herbivores with the monkey tails and uh, the omnivores. So uh, yeah, I, yeah, they were just they were the pretty ones, and I so I got some, and I, I've actually I've got Yeah, I've, yeah, they're they're crazy looking, and they're I mean they're flighty, but I, I've noticed I've had them. Uh, I've had these guys here. My adults are a little better, uh, but my babies that I got from uh, Elavage Lazard, uh, Lisa Beth. Yes, yeah, she, she's amazing. Uh, these guys are some of the most beautiful lemons i've seen so i'm just excited to see as they keep growing what they're gonna turn into every shed is just like oh you're you're oranger now that's crazy <laughs> that's awesome and you're hoping to breed them you said yeah i'd like to i have um so we have six animals uh all from her ex uh and they're so they're all from different pairs. Uh, sorry not they're all from different pairs uh each two we got are from different pairs Okay, cool. Yeah. So we'll we'll do what we can with that, and then hopefully we can find somebody else who's working with them, and we can go from there and try to work something out. I always like to do stuff like that before I just sell an animal, especially with something like a Euromastix Yemenensis. You really want to make sure again it's getting into the right hands right so that yeah, because uh, nothing's coming out of Yemen. So um, yeah, it's really important to just keep things like that going, right? And and. Yeah. By buying that many different bloodlines, I'm a sh even though it's from the same person, they're separate animals that she's brought in. So, um, yeah, it's just it's good to have that. You avoid the bottleneck long term, or exactly. try your best to. You try your best. You try your yeah. best always, right? Like uh, they did pretty good in bearded dragons for a while, and even now you're seeing a lot more hybridization just because they were running into issues. So, yeah, uh, I heard there. There's a. A, a different uh subspecies of bearded dragon that they're breeding into the common one the P pogona viceps vi vi something yeah. something like that yeah um so they're breeding a different subspecies into them now it's kind of bringing them back to like being more healthy but yes yeah 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 i mean i it's probably it's 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 not the best outcome for sure i mean not the not outcome outcome wouldn't be the right word but yeah. it's not the best situation because we got we got ourselves here um, but there's, right. it's also an Australian animal. So you're working with limited. So it's kind of a, a lot of, a lot of the hobby is kind of a weird balancing act, right? I agree. It's sometimes it's beautiful balancing act and sometimes it's ugly and everyone's falling off the teeter totter. <laughs> <laughs> agreed. Agreed. Um, okay. Awesome. Should we get into the collards then? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, um, is there anything other than collards you're keeping actually first? Don't mention the collards will like. Yeah, so no, uh, in here it is just the uh, the euros and the collards. This room is just 
too hot and too dry for anybody else. Yeah. We've got a de we got a dehumidifier in the corner and a fan running. And yeah, this this room. Wow. Um, I, I, I can only wear a sweater in here because I'm some sort of weird human anomaly where I'm just always cold. I'm okay. always cold. So yeah, that, that makes sense. I was gonna ask actually, I saw you wearing a sweater and, and when I film in here in like a shirt and it's like 23, 24, I start sweating. So I can only yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, I don't know what it is. I, I it's crazy. I'll I'll do my whole day of work in a in a sweatshirt and my wife will just look at me like, what are you doing? And I'm yeah. like, it's co it's cold. It's co I'm cold. <laughs> it's, it's cold out. It's, I don't I don't do I don't do well with snow. The first I was gonna fall. say, yeah, you and you, yeah. you live in Canada. That's yeah. Yeah. So a lot of the uh, the food that we get for the monkey tails and for the Euromastix uh, and our feeder insects, Brie grows in the garden. Uh, or we for we forage it off of our acreage. Just we um, part of the story that I left out of the top shelf gecko story is that uh, being a reptile breeder in a big city is not sustainable, and you probably need to move to the middle of nowhere. So yes. <laughs> we live in the middle of nowhere, and we have land, and uh, so we take care of a lot of the food ourselves for the animals in terms of um, the greenery, uh, gut loading our own crickets with what we grow in the garden, um, just feed or feeding our crickets uh, what we grow in the garden. And you're breeding um, your own crickets as well? Uh, we don't breed our own crickets. That would be the one thing uh, my wife won't let me do. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah so I, I have a lot of crickets uh, delivered, um, usually bi-weekly. Right now we're, we're kind of every third week, once a month kind of thing, because it's really only the baby collards that are eating a large amount of crickets right now, uh, and the yeah. chihua, obviously. Yeah. Um, but most of our gargoyles are of size where they turn their nose up to them. So yeah, it's, it, we definitely slowed down a lot in terms of our crickets right now. But in the summer, uh, it's yeah, it's typically we do about twenty to twenty five thousand every two weeks. So wow. yeah. a lot wow. of crickets, yeah, a lot of crickets. Yeah. It's a lot, yeah. We, we, I mean, a part of that we compensate for the fact that some will will die um, as we're keeping them over that time. Uh, but we do a, a weekly, you know, bin clean out, get them, then don't feed those for a bit while we feed the other ones that weren't in the bin, other bin. And it's yeah, like I said, it's all just a balancing act of doing what we can. But uh, yeah, breeding feeders is a lot of work. People that do oh, it, course. yeah, people. I think people underestimate how much really goes into it because. Um, mealworms are fairly easy if you get you know your own little setup going uh, a lot of my stuff doesn't want to eat mealworms uh, i don't also i'm not a huge fan of mealworms yeah. just for the fact that there's no chase to it i love i, I love the movement right i want to see my animals moving because if an animal can chase down a cricket across an enclosure it's probably healthy right it's it's like yeah, it's i like to, it's, it's just, like yeah. it's like it's those little tests of like are you are you really hunting i like seeing my collards you know if a cricket goes under their water dish i see them immediately just get that sand out of the way and get under there for it it's that good like yeah, they're they're interacting with their enclosure and mealworms. They're thinking, they're thinking exactly. Mealworms are just going to sit in the dish. They are good. I, I'm not saying people shouldn't feed, feed mealworms ever. Um, just very diet is big. We try to feed different stuff, but crickets are definitely our staple. But um, yeah. that's just because it, it's probably the. If I had to say I make a sacrifice, I'm you know, putting that in quotes because like I don't consider crickets a sacrifice. I know a lot of people hate them, but yeah. I consider I consider them a good feeder. You can do. A lot with them and you can you can very easily gut load them uh you can fill them up nutritionally really well just by feeding them well um i realize the problems that do come with them but yeah variety is key for sure i uh, yeah i agree variety is key and uh the only thing that yeah i mean people already know mealworms and the chitin is also another thing to like be careful of so variety is key but yeah 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 uh so yeah so the Ooh, collar colors lizards. yeah, yeah. So how many, I don't know, like, okay, so before you tell me how many subspecies you're keeping and like all of that info on them, where do they come from? Um, like where in the world do they come from? Kind of habitat, all of that stuff. Uh, so they are, um, I want to say like central South United States. Um, you can find them all the way out towards like Utah in some places. Uh, certain subspecies are from Utah. Um, I, I, the furthest up you're going to find them would be uh, U Utah or uh, like lower parts of Kansas, I believe. And then they range all the way down to um, pretty much right when like the um, the Mexican desert would end right before I, I forget the name of the town, but there's like a vacation hotspot that people go to that's around right before that. Cause it's kind of just uh, as you go down like center Mexico, it's desert. And then the, the, the shorelines are the more tropical areas, right? Yeah. So they would be they would be in the more central area there, but obviously not going down too far. The the so the species you're keeping, um, 
come from what what areas or what what's this uh, why can't I phrase this word question? Okay, here, 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 here's the the best free best here, way to here. phrase this. I, I, I can, I can, I can, I think break down what you're going for right now. Okay, so yes, here, in here. in in the in the wild, um, so these are uh, they would be crotophytus cholerus, um, uh, and then uh, what I keep is in the cholerus, right? So um, there is other crotophytus. So that's that's the difference. There. There's nine species of collared lizards. Um, I keep only subspecies of cholerus. So in the wild over that range that I said, there would be uh, nine species. They would be crotophytus, not cholerus. They would be something else. Uh, there's okay. Dickerson's, um, there's uh, Vestigium reticula uh, reticula I can't, reticulatus. Um, there's, there's a bunch, right? And then I keep um, cholerus specifically. So I keep crotophytus, cholerus, and then I have oriceps, which are these guys here. Uh, they're considered yellow heads. Uh, yellow heads are, uh, I always mix up the two. I've mixed them up with Bailey eye. Uh, oriceps are the Utah ones, Utah yellow heads. And then uh, I keep cholerus cholerus, which would be the most common one. They would be like Eastern collared lizards. Okay. I, I do have, I do have the Wichita mountain locality, uh, which is uh, a higher North locality, probably in line with the oriceps in Utah in terms of how far North collards go. Uh, and then the last one I keep, which is my favorite, is the uh, Cholerus melanum maculatus, um, which if you know, um, like your Latin phonetics breakdown, uh, melon usually means uh, black and then uh, maculatus is spotted. So spotted or yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So they're so they're black spotted collar lizards. Um, they're they're uh, almost pure silvery gray with the black spots that you would see on other collared lizards. I think they are by far uh, my favorite. I don't know if I'm just biased because the animals I got were so healthy uh, and, and beautiful when I got them and they just, they thrive right off the bat. Um, are those so, the ones, the species you're bringing to the expo? No. So those are the, uh, the Wichita mountain ones, which are uh, Eastern collared lizards. They're the most common ones. Uh, I just have a, a specific locality of it, which it's funny enough in the States, people, tend to not really care it's a collared lizard they don't uh they, they don't care like, where it comes from yeah they're like wichita mountain whatever um it's more of a european thing i did get those guys from europe funnily enough i got american lizards from europe <laughs> yeah um they i just a long turn around the world right yeah so they so uh though they were bred in europe brought here and i just um i just got them because i was already uh i was already getting some collared lizards um i kind of have a rule where i don't like to bring in new um Full on species, uh, but to me, that's you know, I'm I'm keeping cholera still. I'm just keeping subspecies. So I try to I try to do like one. If I bring in new things, I try to keep like a, it to like a species um, every like six months or a year. I don't like I don't feel like you can learn much if like when I see people go into an expo and every expo they're bringing something home. I'm like, what are you learning about that animal? Yeah, what's, how go, what's going? What's going? We move on to the next one. Yeah, it's like it's like it's not even like it's not that they might not take care of it. It's just your care is definitely not optimal if you're, you know, like uh, there's so much I learn about all of these guys, just being around them as much as I do um, that, that, yeah, it's, 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 it's hard to imagine someone getting an animal and then being like, Oh, I can get a different species with totally different care requirements. And it's like, well, like how much are you really perfecting that one's thing? We like, we do really have a responsibility to like do our best so uh yeah when i see that kind of thing where people are just turning over so for me it was kind of like i'm uh, that's how i like to reason it to myself i was getting cholerus already yes. so uh, getting another cholerus wasn't a huge deal the care is extremely similar um i keep my melons like a, uh, i call them my melons they're my melon melon maculatus i keep them a little bit warmer uh because they are the mexican locality um and it does get a bit hotter there um but I, I like I, we're talking a couple degrees hotter. I don't, you know, I keep everyone gets a basking spot of minimum 95 hot area to about 105. Uh, those guys, I do 110. That's it. There's not, it's not a huge jump and they, they, they use it. So I'm not going to take it from them. <laughs> and everything else care wise is the same between all the subspecies. Yeah. Yeah. So everyone eats the same. Um, I, I set them up the same. Uh, I think a big thing when you're keeping collared lizards is making sure that they have rock. A lot of, I know cork, I know cork's kind of like the go-to, 
uh, in the industry because it's it's lightweight. It's easy. I don't want to say it's easy to clean, but I mean, you can soak it and you can get poo off of it. But yeah. and it's light. It's light when you carry it wherever you got to clean it. But rock, I, I I started to almost put rock in almost every enclosure now. Because uh, it holds the heat or? Uh, it holds the heat, number one. Like you can see the whole basking area behind me is just a massive rock that I dug out of uh, my wife's garden. When I dug her, her... We, we live in the we live in the Canadian Shield, so it's rocky here. Okay, yeah. So uh, when I dug up her garden, I basically just went, "Oh, cool! I never need to buy a rock for my lizards again." <laughs> like I, I have infinite rocks to a point. I built gate pillars out of rocks because oh. we had so many. So yeah, rocks are just important for yeah holding heat. Uh, it's also just a different texture, right? If something if you're just giving cork everywhere, I, I don't know. It's like walking on carpet all day, right? It's yeah. just yeah, I don't know. There's different textures, different. And animals need to experience different things and as close to the different things as we can in the wild. And these guys are rock crevice dwellers. So I'm big on like stack. I make a, a nice stack. So I know on the bottom, uh, I do, I usually, for example, uh, the one behind me is a triangle. So I make sure that each corner or point of the triangle has a rock under it. And then I place the big rock on it. So that means that they can get under there. Yeah. And I, that is huge to them because I, Every lizard that I do that with, or every collared lizard I've done that with, has used that rock hide. They don't use any of the other hides I provide them. They want to make their own. Yeah. So they're and definitely something you can set up where um, I saw another, uh, I, I forget his YouTube name, to be honest. I think his name's Ryan Tran. Um, he posted in a collared lizard group. He's got some cool collared lizards and he made, uh, it was like a double layer almost. He had his sand basically on top of what a, a bioactive enclosure would be, a typical bioactive yeah. enclosure. And I thought that was awesome because it that's that's what's out there, right? It's not that it's not, that whole layer doesn't go, you know, the earth doesn't just go rock, rock, rock. There's other things. They're digging under those rocks to get in somewhere, right? And he's so, not worried about them like collapsing or I guess they're held up well. Well, I, 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 I assume he, most people do what I do. I, I balance the rocks. And I don't have a fear of the top rock shifting off the bottom rocks because the top rock is so heavy. No, nothing's moving, right? Yeah. I also, I also um, I did a video on Instagram a week ago where I showed me rearranging this enclosure. And you can see the whole time I move a rock, I always smack it. I think that's just like, you really want to make sure your rocks are there, yeah. right? Push it so yeah. it doesn't, yeah. yeah. I, I'll just smack them as hard as I can. The lizard's not in there, right? It's, yeah. So like when I'm setting it up, I'll just make sure that uh, these guys weigh like 20 grams. They're not doing They're what not my hands yeah, can do. Yeah, so, as long, I, so I make sure it is secure with a base of rocks and that those rocks won't shift. I use very flat rocks. So I know that they're only getting a small, maybe inch or two crevice under there. Um, but like I have big lips on my enclosure so I can get a good uh, four to five inches of sand and they all... Uh, we'll dig into that sand. If if you give them a wet area, which we do in uh, the far corner of every collared enclosure, they get a nice little wet area. They'll all burrow under rocks there. So, Do you spray them at all? Or is it just refill the water bowls? It just refill the water bowls. Yes. Uh, I, I've, noticed they're really, no, I've noticed they're really good about go, just go, going to it when they want it. Uh, I know there's some lizards that are just going to sit there and wait for you to spray, right? That bought, yeah. move the, Or they need moving water. I've seen all of these guys, they'll just go up to the water dish, drink out of it, and hop right back to the basking spot. It's interesting, yeah, because I heard you mention earlier that you have a dehumidifier in there. So I'm like, they must like it like pretty dry. Yeah, so we keep the room, what is it at right now? So the room's at 40 right now, 40% humidity. Okay. Um, and if it gets above that, uh, the dehumidifier will kick on. Hopefully it won't do it during this because it's pretty loud. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so we try to keep it 35 to 40. Okay. It's, it's typical desert species humidity um we don't provide the uromastics uh regularly with water uh because they're uromastics and uh when their enclosures are the way they are having the water in there can raise the humidity uh the collared lizards uh they do get up to 45 sometimes but it's it's not a big deal with them whereas with the uromastics we do big open tops more ventilation on their enclosures just to make sure uh they don't get any higher than that because they like it very dry or very dry yeah dry and and yeah. they, they is that the thing with your masks that people don't don't do water bowls i I've actually... i i yeah most i most people um i know some people will give them small water bowls uh but for the most part uh they're getting all of their hydration from their greens we feed our Euromastics daily they're never not going to get their greens um and they're not eating their greens every day so they're they're definitely hydrated. You can tell a dehydrated Euromastix very quickly. Just from the I, look of it? 
Yeah, I would. Re I wouldn't recommend people to do that immediately. If you're just bringing your own mastics home, a lot of your own mastics, uh, especially in Canada, if they didn't come from Lisa Beth, they are possibly wild caught. Um, so it's best to give wild caught animals that option. Um, I, I've I've given my Yemen's water before because some people do say they like uh, a higher humidity and will drink more often. I I just, I've never seen it so. Um, and again, I'm, I, I'm not, one of, I'm not saying that is I never see it. I'm, I never see it. And I'm with these animals, you know, all day. So like yeah. my office is, my office is right outside this room. So cool. Okay. So, I, I, and the, your mastics are herbivores that's how to get their hydration, all that, but are the collards yes. also herbivores or are they eating? No, I, I would. So in the, in the wild, they would be considered a, a carnivore, an obligate carnivore, just okay. due to the fact that they, they do require carnivorous prey. Um, and in the wild, mainly uh, their diet does consist of other lizards. Okay, yeah, so lizard eaters, yeah. They're, yeah, they're big lizard eaters. Uh, you, the mouth on them, when they open it, you can see why. They can they, they can fit most things they want in there. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, makes sense. <laughs> yeah, so, but it, it, yeah, in captivity, we're feeding them. Uh, like I said, we do variety. We do super worms. Um, we do uh, mealworms rare, not as often. Um, they're just, they're very small compared to the lizard size. So they're not gonna yeah. provide much without eating a lot of them. Not very filling, yeah. Yeah, uh, and, and then crickets are definitely our staple just because of the amount of feeders we need. Awesome, uh, yeah, so they're not eating any- um, I've, 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 d I've done vegetation before. There's some people in the collard groups um, that are like, yeah, yeah, mine take it, mine take it. Uh, every part of every reading I've done and everything I've seen, uh, they they don't care. They might eat vegetation in the wild, but uh, Euromastics eat bugs in the wild. So yeah, yeah, cool. that that makes sense. Uh, cool. Okay, so uh, like looking behind you right now, the we, we something that we were talking about before we went on as well. Uh, it's it's super super bright, and yes, you have strong lights and you're painting the backgrounds white. Uh, yeah, and all that. So it's, it's super super bright. Do you think that they? if it was a little bit darker, like, do you think how much light there is depends on how easily they can find and see their prey? Um, I'm not sure. I, I possibly uh, only because I, I would say more so that they're more active, the brighter it is when, when they yeah. feel, when they feel like it is like, that's why they're, they're moving around. Um, I've done cages before, uh, the kit, you can't see it, but the cage that's below them, uh, was actually darker before. Uh, I just had a shorter UVB light in it. Uh, so it wasn't providing as much light. Um, and then I, I, I kind of noticed those lizards were um, not lethargic. They just weren't as active as everyone else. Okay. Uh, so I moved a uh, jungle dawn, just like a, a bright LED light in there, just supplementary lighting, right? Not, not an actual, it's not going to provide them with anything except for visible light. And uh, they all just started coming out more oh, and yeah. basking more and eating more. And, and yeah, I feel like, um, with these guys, just because of where they're from, they're just going to sit out on a rock. Uh, all, all they're doing in the wild is looking for something to eat and sitting on a rock. Yeah. And that rock is in a, a desert. It's in a hot, rocky desert. So yeah, as bright as, as you can do it. I just see them. I, uh, he's, he's going crazy right now. They just, it, I, light to me has been a big thing. I've definitely noticed, um, like I've been keeping reptiles now for a, a good bit. Um, I guess I've been keeping for like 12 or 13 years and um i the lighting has just come so far with stuff like arcadia now where uh you what, you can you notice it right and, and you just mentioned the jungle dawn and all that but what do you use for for lighting and for uvb uh so we use uh i use pretty much all arcadia uh in this room um so the collared lizards that have their lights mounted inside their enclosures are on 12 percent uh, same with, uh, the Euromastics. If anyone has, uh, this, there's a uh, Euromastics in front of me that has hers on top of a screen, she gets a 14%. Um, it's basically the, the distance or, you know, you have to know these things like the distance, if, uh, if it's going through a screen, uh, we have a UV meter. So we, you know, we do readings to make sure they're at the correct levels, but uh, mainly we're using the 12 and 14%. Uh, then for basking bulbs, the Euromastics typically get the 75 watt, uh, Arcadia basking bulb uh, and the 50 watt for the collards awesome and you so you mentioned going through screen or not going through what's uh, or like yeah how do you mount them if they're not going to screen are they on the inside or is it kind of like a more of an open top kind of thing uh so all of these enclosures i built uh all of these for the collards and the euromastics myself um 
Uh, so I, I mounted them up top with just the little brackets that Arcadia provides you. Uh, they're dry enclosures, so I'm not concerned about yeah. um, buildup of humidity and the wood rotting. I also used uh, really nice oak for all of them because I don't really like sparing expenses. So these are um, these are built to last my A lifetime and their and their yeah. lifetime, hopefully. So worst case, some glass breaks maybe, but yeah. Well, so so you said my lifetime and their lifetime. What is their lifetime? What is the lifespan on them? <laughs> The collared lizards? Or oh, no, I said that wrong. But yeah, how, how, how long is their lifespan generally? Uh, so in the wild, it's not very long because they're probably going to get eaten by another collared lizard. Yeah. So uh, probably under five years in the, the wild. In captivity, um, I think 10 to 12 years. is t 10 would probably be a better a better thing to say around there. It, collared lizards can eat collared lizards? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like definitely. adults can eat an adult? um no an adult would have no qualms about eating a bunch of babies though okay yeah yeah they are they're, they're lizard eaters right in the in the wild so they they're their mouth start you can definitely see they're equipped for it when they when they give you the smile it is it's it's ear to ear it's a <laughs> yeah. big mouth and yeah and a, a, their teeth are pretty sharp uh yeah yeah i've never yeah. been bit by any of my adults actually but uh okay. the babies the babies like to kind of give you like uh if your hand gets in there they'll test to see if you're a cricket and like yeah they've they've little guys have given me little you know pinpricks before but yeah not, I, nothing I got, too bad i got an import one of my mountain or dragon females and i was not expecting it to be uh that sharp or, or that like yeah. that big of a bite um yeah cool okay so um you have many different locales and subspecies Yep. Are you, you're, you already mentioned that, uh, the mellow, uh, Mel, me, uh, melon immaculatus. Yes. You, oh, sorry. No, those aren't, you said you're taking the Mount Wichita ones to the, the Eastern. Yeah. So the ones, the expo. yeah. So the ones I've been bringing to the expo are the, uh, the cholerus cholerus. So just, uh, Eastern collar lizards, but I do have the Wichita mountain locale, um, which I, um, when I, you know, when I first got them and, and I'm a Canadian, so I, you know, we did, I did the, Oh, Wichita. It's like, that's Kansas. Uh, the mountain range isn't fully in Kansas, so um, I'm not exactly sure. I think it's like uh, I'm really bad with United States geography, but uh, <laughs> it's it's on it's on the more uh, western side of of Kansas, closer to I don't want to say Missouri and make anyone angry from the states, but I think in that direction, <laughs> Missouri, yeah, probably something like that. But yeah, Ooh, they're okay. they're from they're from that mountain range. Um, so I just. When it comes to localities, I just I really like knowing where an animal's from. It gives you um, a bit better of an idea of the range or what's going on in the habitat, so you can just adjust what you're doing a little bit more. Um, that's I I used to do a lot of the morph stuff, and I think I just found uh, like with the fat tails, obviously. Um, and I think I just found it a lot more fulfilling to work with stuff that's uh, locality based because it, it felt like you were. Preserving feels like it, it, yeah, pre preserving something in a way, right? Yeah. Where human humans are so destructive that it's just like, who who knows what's going to be where soon. Um, Let me go the other way. Yeah, it's the same thing with the monkey tails, right? Where I I, I see a lot of people getting monkey tails as pets, and and I'm uh, I'm always kind of iffy about monkey tails being pets because I don't think most people understand like what's going on in the Solomon Islands. So I, I it always concerns me when people jump really quickly on like I, I get it, they're cute, they're adorable, they look like little muppets. And they're they're friendly they're friendly for the most part but like um there's like a lot of there's like if you do a, if you do a good amount of reading on them it, it it's a little depressing about what's going on there and, and the amount of forest that's being destroyed at, at a rate fairly quickly so and so you think anybody that has them should try to breed them yes definitely i don't i i, I or or i think they should i don't i don't want to sound rude and say suck it up but i think they should put them in hands of someone who wants to at least establish um a, a program that can regularly provide babies in captivity. Um, monkey tails are one of those things where like everyone seems to like them and a lot always come in, but um, you don't really see the fruits of all of them coming in. Right. Yeah. You, you don't know where they go or where they end up and you never see them again. Yeah. So that, so to me, localities are kind of like that, uh, you know, like the, the invisible arc thing we all like to convince ourselves of. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but it's that, like, it's not, it's, it's, but not to that extent, it's just sort of like, for me, it feels better. I, I, I love morphs. They're beautiful animals, but I, I just, the locality based and the, the knowing what species, um, like keeping that species, like the, the Yemenensis, for example, um, even the Melon Immaculatus, like there's not a huge amount of those as far as collared lizards go. Um, 
in breeding groups. That being said, there's a lot of people breeding collared lizards in the States, so it's more. Um, but yeah, it's very important that if people are getting animals that are wild caught, it just needs to be so that we're stopping the wild caught animals. It's, I, it's that simple. <laughs> I, I agree. I agree. That's hopefully, uh, fingers crossed, what I'm trying to do with the mountain horned dragons as well. Um, yeah. But but we, we will see. Uh, okay. So, so the, so yeah, the reason brought up. So the Eastern collared lizards, we know you're breeding them. Um, you're bringing it to the expos, obviously what other, uh, subspecies from the ones you have, are you successful with so far or have you been? Uh, so, so, so I've only been successful with those ones so far because they are the only ones I've raised, uh, to have adults. Okay. Um, cool. Yeah. I, I, yeah. So, and then I'm also, um, I, I purchased some adults and then I've raised some up now. Um, and then hopefully, um, my melon immaculatus are of size now, uh, that they will go, uh, this year coming up like next year. Um, but we're kind of in the phase right now where, um, we're so I, I, I still want them to be a bit bigger. So we're not, uh, we're not brewmating yet. We're waiting. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, they, yeah, yeah. 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 So I, I, a big thing is like everything in my rooms is controlled. So I can make sure that if one enclosure is cold, that doesn't mean another enclosure is cold. So we can brewmate animals in, in separate enclosures. How do you do yeah. that? Uh, just ceramic heat emitters, ceramic heat okay. emitters attached to thermostats. I think, um, I think that it, it, it should be used more. I, I always find it weird when breeders are like, I take, uh, I've I was a beardy breeder I was talking to you once and he's like, well, I take the mail out and I like wrap them in a towel and I like put them in like a, a mini fridge. And I know some guys do that for like roommating. And to me, that's just weird. Cause like I've gone so far to provide so much to replicate what they'd have. It would be weird if they couldn't do it in there. Right. So, so, right. so what you do is you drop the room temperature and you heat up specific tanks then, or yeah yeah so uh naturally in this basement will get a bit colder uh we're in a i'm in a basement for my reptile rooms uh so the other the other room uh i pretty much always just keep it closed uh but this room's door will be open during uh the day and then i close it at night and that just keeps me where i want to be so and what's what temperature do you like to permit them at or like how low do you six, need six, 65. 65 okay yeah 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 65 is when they'll typically start doing it on their own i just make sure that if i am going to be doing that i'm not feeding them beforehand right and then how long do you kind of keep them going for i guess you're uh, doing it naturally it's the, the throughout the entire winter um so yeah it, it depends yeah it does definitely depend um so last year it was basically uh this is th this is all kind of new to me in terms of what we're doing here because we moved here um this is our second year in this house. Okay. So uh, a lot of it, when you move, I, don't, I mean, I don't know if a lot of anyone's moved with a large reptile collection before, especially like one that is a, a you know, like has a breeding part to it. Um, it it's, it's different, you know, we're, we're in a, we're much farther North. It's just colder here in general. So that affects the fact that, you know, our rooms are uh, pretty much at ground level here. So certain times of the year we need heaters or whatever, but, um yeah so it, it was kind of uh test run. Uh, not yeah test run last year sort of yeah exactly that's a good way to put it a test I, run. I, I did the same thing when i moved i was like this year i'm not going to do anything because i need to know how cold every room gets and how warm every room gets and all of that yeah even yeah even my fat tails i used to um i would say like but uh, probably like two weeks from now i'd have my first set of eggs in my old house um yeah. of my season and i am actually just hatching my last babies out today i had two babies hatch out today and those were the last from my last season last so season. the animals just ended up going way later um so i i can control only so much um right like it's still i i still believe animals can feel feel the out external environmental changes yeah i wonder um, if pressure is also something because that's I, something we can't really control I, I think it's a big thing especially when we're talking with like a north north american species uh like the collards like we're far from them but like we're not that far from them right so yeah. it's yeah i it, it's definitely been a learning process and so i'm hoping this year um we'll have more than just the two females going yeah. So, so how does it, yeah. So you brew made them a couple of months, bring it back up. And then, um, are you keeping your pairs together year round or do you introduce the mail? Uh, yeah, no, I, I, uh, so I try to keep stuff together. Um, if they're going to be a group, I'll try to raise them together. Um, 
I, I've just had a lot of problems with not not only collars, but just other species of them beefing when they're not. Um, so like certain species, like my fat tails, um, they they don't stay together because they're they're a solitary uh, animal. Um, but a lot of these kind of lizards, like the collar lizards, they don't. They're not hanging out in a group, but there's a lot of them hanging out in the same in area. One area. Yeah. Ex yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, I like to raise them together because I tech I I. I I've had less issues uh, that way. I did have to split up uh, some of my melan melan maculatus, uh just because the male got much bigger than the females uh, very quickly. So he's um, there, there in this one up here, and he's way over here. So, because yeah, you can't even let these guys like see the females once they're they're ready to go. Oh, they'll just like keep trying to get them, banging against the glass kind of thing. Yeah, they're just kind of like that bro who won't stop ever. That just like, yeah. keeps like, it's just like, hey, hey, kind of thing. And like, he's just always bobbing and running and just like looking at them. And um, yeah. my, my buddy Aaron, who is uh, from the States and he breeds collars, he's, he's, uh, he's helped me like, basically like he was like don't let males look at each other like you know, if you're doing your enclosure, set them up this way. He's helped a lot of my like, I, I would say my success of what I did was just little advice he gave me like, a, you know, another keeper. For sure it's always those like i've said this before but it's always the attention to detail those little things that make the difference it's it's fine tuning right yeah, yeah. That's, what I was, that's what i was trying to say before it's like if you set up i've taken so much time to set it up in a way that i want them to feel like it's their environment uh so i should be able to replicate all things that right. they would do in their environment and if they can't then i most likely need to change something right me not them that makes sense that absolutely makes sense I, it's kind of a, a, there's people always say it's like the European versus the American keeping where the, the European they're very uh, if the animals will do it in the beautiful naturalistic enclosure you got them in then you're doing it right um, and then the other ones kind of you know make money or cram stuff in tubs and stuff and it's like I can um, make them do it I, yeah like I can make them do it and I, I I much prefer the letting them just sort of do it like I've I've even noticed with brewmating in the enclosures. Uh, the animals will come out sometimes they'll they'll wander out like oh what's going on and then go back right so yeah just walk I, around get some water yeah, I, we we could have a hot day randomly and again like i said this room is uh this room's a little less ventilated than the other room um so i that's why i do the door thing it just makes sure that my airflow and my temperature stays where i want it um i kind of forget where i was going with that one to be honest but <laughs> um about like just being able to uh, like uh, brewmate them on oh on yeah so I, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so they had just it's just if, if i have everything set up right they should just go right that's that's kind of the idea i have i know it's not gonna work in every scenario but i feel like that's it, it makes me feel better doing it that way right yeah no 100 percent uh, cool. Okay. So how many, like, um, how many, like, what's the group kind of like, is it one male to multiple females? I try, uh, I try to do uh one male to two females, uh, okay. trios just because like I said about the males, they're very ready to go most of the time. Uh, and if you just have a female in there, it, you will definitely have to remove your male. Um, so like it, it, I always tell people, you know, if you're going to keep them a trios good, if you want babies, if you just want a beautiful animal, a male collared lizard is a great pet yeah yeah the way to go yeah um do, do they have multiple clutches a year or is it just the yes. one yeah 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 so uh they'll have from one uh, pairing or i yeah. guess they're, yeah okay so i i had um i had five clutches this year uh from two females okay so cool. yeah so one gave me two and one gave me three and but you do you know if they're uh retaining the sperm or if the male is just continuously getting them um no, because he was actually removed at one point in the season because we had a squabble in there. So okay. um, I I would assume it, it wasn't. Are. Yeah, that it's like a bearded dragon. They'll they'll multi clutch. They're very they're very similar to to beardies in a lot of ways. Yeah, and how are you incubating the eggs on sand or as for, well? Ver or? Vermiculite. I use vermiculite for every species. Every There's day. yeah. I don't uh I don't stray from my that's. Yeah. I hate well, to sound I, like I, hate I, stick to what I know. Dudes, I stick to what I know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's just it's, it's worked for me. Like I started with that with the fat tails, and uh, or actually I started with that with the bearded dragons. I think even the first thing I ever did, I just vermiculate right away. Um, cool. And yeah, it's it's just when you get used to vermiculate, yeah, you just sort of know the consistency, and it's really easy to just you know what you need. Yeah, yeah. 
Hundred percent. I've never used vermiculite actually. I used to use uh, perlite, and now I use the um, uh, super hatch just because it's like you can boil it and reuse it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, I usually have to like w with the desert species. I usually put them like on in sand onto wet uh, vermiculite. Is that something you do, or is it just eggs can go straight into the vermiculite? Eggs just go straight into the incubator in the vermiculite. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So another thing we spoke about at the expo and kind of mentioned it on the. Um, expo video which by the way there like there isn't uh, like a recap of the last expo on my other channel go check it out but you mentioned um that they are quick plug you know um yeah. you mentioned that they are better or i don't want to say better like they can be as good of pets as beardies or if not better um so i the reason i would say they're better is what you want to talk about later yes so okay. um but i in terms without that, I think they're very similar. Um, I'm not, like I've said, I said earlier, I really like my animals to be moving. I like to see movement. I like to see exploring. I like to see digging. If you're arboreal, climb. <laughs> like, yeah. just, I, I, and I'm not doing it for my entertainment, right? It's just, I feel like that's what they would be doing. So I want to see natural behaviors. Yeah, so, you don't want to um, see like a lethargic animal, like you said earlier. Like no, yeah. Like and, and, the, or... and the beardies tend to have that now and again that might have been what we were talking about earlier as well with the them needing to hybrid now is they were going all right like these animals are a little too <laughs> like you know like they have that um i don't know a, a polite word for it they're just they're derpy there's not much going much on potatoes. there yeah they're and i don't know if that's just because they got the rep is like oh look at this cute animal and then there ends up being a lot of um obesity in them you know like a lot of a lot of the cute reptiles suffer from obesity problems yeah so it's just yeah. part and of a lot of beardies you see are very obese often as well yeah yeah and it's really easy to fix obesity in reptiles so it's always sad when you see you know an obese beardy or someone's like look how cute my crestie is and you're like that thing should not have 50 rolls <laughs> like that's insane <laughs> yeah 100 percent. so like it's I, I, again i don't want to see them looking like they look in the wild because they look rough a lot of the time but uh, it's it's our responsibility to make sure that these animals don't end up as little round, like fat, lethargic pancakes, right? So a good uh, middle, yeah, a good, a good middle, exactly, yeah. And and I think the collared lizards they they give you that like, yeah, look at me, I'm entertaining, I'm gonna run around and catch my food. Um, they're they're lightning fast, but like you've seen at the shows, I can just open the cage up to show people, and they're like come right into your hands, yeah, yeah, like they're 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 a really good captive bred reptile. Some captive bred reptiles, you you know, generation after generation, they seem to just be just as skittish. These guys are just like, yeah, it's crazy how trusting they are to their size, right? Yeah, and do you find all the subspecies are like that or are some a little more friendly than others? Um, I got my oraceps and my melons as um, babies. So I feel like I kind of have like a good judge of that because... Um, and I would say the oriceps might have been a little more shy at first, but overall that could just be the fact I'm I'm working with a very small group to say anything definitive, right? Um, but yeah, they definitely course. they were a little more timid than uh, the melons. The melons were like right away they were second day they were like hey crickets and right at the front of the enclosure. <laughs> cool. So um, no, I'd say I'd say most of the collarists, as long as you're getting captive bred, which you don't always get with the collarist collarist, um, then. Uh, they're all going to be good as long as again captive bred captive over and over captive bred it's so important to get captive bred animals and from a reliable source and from yeah quality animals from a reliable source exactly 100 percent. cool so you just mentioned it's something we want to talk about um I, I so we were talking earlier and you mentioned i'm not even going to be able to say this word so you're probably oh, I, <laughs> I struggle i struggle so i think it's a diverse Diversity C or something like that, agamenum. Okay, yes. Uh, I, 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 I'm gonna, I was going to go somewhere. Diversia. Diversia, yeah. Right, yeah. Something Ag like that. Okay. Ag agamenum or something like that. Agam yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. I, so, I don't feel like I need to know how to. <laughs> My, my, my wife's taken a lot of schooling and there was like a part of a course she took to basically said, I think we told you this at an expo. Um, and it was one of the teachers or like a, a someone who was giving a lecture. It was basically even if you can't say the scientific name right, 
just try to say it because you're probably going to give someone a better idea of what you're going for than being like green lizard. And grow, common, some, common names. Yeah. hundred yeah, percent. Yeah. Because if we're... When you're talking about collars, right, there's nine species and then you have the subspecies with five subspecies in it. And if you're like a collared lizard, it could be any of those. But if you're like, I'm, you know, I got reticulatus, I'd be like, that's illegal. You can't. I want something. But like, why are they illegal? I believe it's the range they're in. I think they're in California and I don't believe you can. I'm, I, I, I stand out. to be corrected. Yeah, it might be. They might be. I, I know that wherever they're from, you can't take any out um, and nobody can get, uh, there's a couple of people that used to have like permits for them. Uh, by far, I think the coolest colored lizard looks wise. They're, yeah. they're okay. insane. Yeah, they're insane looking. They're, de they're definitely something I would like to see um, in the wild for sure. Like color wise or? Color pattern, all of it. They're, they almost have like a full body um, spot to them, like everything. And then the color, the colors are, insane they're just uh like oranges greens blues just co colored lizards are amazing because they're just so bright it, it's, it's really rare to see like reptile i know like we see a lot of green stuff but when you see like reptiles that are as blue as some as, of these guys can get it's it's pretty mind-blowing it's it is it's interesting i'm wondering also why they why they adapt or adapted these colors or evolved these colors because I think when you think of desert species, usually a lot of them are more of the uh, sandy colors and like, you know, a beigey kind of colors. And then these are like bright blue, bright orange. So I wonder what benefits um, it has to them. But I guess the uh, some of the aromatics are also like that. Yeah, so yeah, must, for sure. It must have some some benefit. Yeah, I mean, with with dart frogs being the way they are, you can only assume that colors in nature means like leave me alone leave kind me of alone. thing. Yeah, I don't, I, guess. I, I don't know what the leave me alone they're trying to intimidate someone with is, but um, uh, yeah, that's and then that's part of the reason I think I like keeping the subspecies is like you were saying there, there's so many of these colors, and it's like I, just keeping a different subspecies, I'm keeping a totally different color. Like, color, yeah. There's yeah, there's the blue. I uh, the oriceps are called yellowheads. Is their common common name uh and they, they will get really really bright yellow heads whereas the melons are going to be just silver and black when they're adults and they're both colorists they're just different subspecies so you get that i like having that uh variety yeah the variety of, of, of <laughs> variety the, is key <laughs> variety, variety is key for sure I, it's definitely you got to um you may got to make sure that you limit it though i see a lot i see a lot of people recently going to expos and every expo it's like it's something new and like i said earlier you need to really make sure that you're pinning something down before you're moving somewhere yeah. else right and very quickly getting overwhelmed and then the whole rehoming thing starts but yeah exactly yeah but anyway so diversia agamarum or agamanum something like Ag that. yeah yeah um what is it and how does it affect um how does it affect the species it affects uh so it is a uh, naturally occurring bacteria in uh, all bearded dragons' mouths. Um, so it's found in them in the wild as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It and and it it's it's just part of their natural mouth flora. Like it is in there to do something for them, whether it be protection or breaking down food. I'm not entirely sure, uh, but it is a bad bacteria uh, for other species. So. Um, uh, the species right now that they're finding it's affecting um, are uh, chuckwallas. So, um, Sara, uh, I forget their, their sign, uh, Sara, something like that. Uh, Lacertas yeah. are affected by it. Um, Euromastics are affected by it. And uh, collared lizards are affected by it. So, Saromalus. Uh, Saromalus, yeah. So, those are uh, chuckwallas. Um, so, those species are affected by it and uh certain species uh in that grouping can very quickly uh succumb to it it does nothing to a bearded dragon uh but if you have a Euromastix and you're swapping bowls and you're not cleaning them thoroughly and i don't just mean scrubbing them with soap i mean bleach cleaning them thoroughly you are running the risk of spreading that to your Euromastix, which then can make your Euromastix sick and die so um, that was why when I said I think that um, collards are a bit better than beardies because you're not dealing with that. And it scares me that it is a problem with beardies uh, only because of how rampant they are in the industry. So there's yeah. so many beardies that 
um, when you go to a pet store, it's almost guaranteed they have a bearded dragon there. That's true. Right? So yeah, then or multiple. Or multiple, and it's probably guaranteed if they're a specialty pet store, they're probably going to have Euromastics there. Yeah. Right? And then and that just goes into Collards and Chucks and Lacertas, right? Those are all going to be there. And when you're dealing with that large variety of animals, it's really hard to make sure that I just saw somebody go flying I, behind I, me. I just, I just <laughs> noticed that at the same time, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's just hard to make sure that you're, you know, you're cleaning everything that well. Um, like, to me, I would, ne I would never own a bearded dragon because the the risk outweighs any reward. I, I, I live for all of these weird little lizards that I'm surrounded by. So to put them at risk just because uh, another species, it's yeah, to me, I, I, I just think it's a big concern because of how many beardies there are. And it's not something a lot of people know about. And think, it's not think, a concern to beardies. So beardy keepers don't even need to worry about it. So it's just really people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That that's, that's it. Right. They can, even if someone, I mean, I don't, I'm, I, I do as much reading as I can on it anytime something new comes out or if another breeder posts something about it, I always make sure I know what's going on. Um, but I don't know how far it goes to if someone was handling their beardy and then they didn't wash their hands, which they should be washing their hands in 2022. But if they didn't, <laughs> and then they come to an expo and they touch one of my collards, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. So things like that worry me because of beardies being everywhere. Um, it, or even at an expo, stop at yeah, my table and come right to your table. It, yeah, that's true. Exactly. Yeah. So I, it's, it's very, it's, it's just very scary. Cause I, I would hate to see somebody who's put a lot of time into any of these lizards um, and really cares about them be like, Oh, you know, it's just a pet bearded dragon. It's not a big deal. And they don't know all of this. Cause I, I do find it something that um, not a lot of, not a lot of people know about it, strangely enough. Yeah. So, so what does it do? Um, what does it do to the, to the lizards it affects? So the lizards it affects will typically get um, a, a, the first, it starts by the skin basically looking different uh, around the hind legs uh, and, and then spreads elsewhere. Um, but it is basically will cause abrasions eventually. It'll just cause open wounds eventually on them. Uh, and some of them will just even succumb before you get to that. Um, there was a post recently by a, a breeder in the Netherlands who breeds collared lizards about uh, the collared lizards being able to get it, which was, news to me again i wasn't going to keep beardies because i knew about it with neuromastics and i had the Euromastics, but um it was news to me about the collared lizards which makes me you know i want to work with these and i would hate for anything to happen to any of my animals so yeah now when i go to shows i have to be cautious of who's been where done what sanitize your hands so it's more just yeah it's it's scary so i i yeah just kind of i think talking about it is is good right it's not don't own a bearded dragon it's just uh if you have one already and you have the other pets, you just make sure you're doing the best you can for those other pets. Right. hundred percent. Yeah. And another thing actually that you mentioned um, before we, we were recording, or we were talking about it uh, is if, is, is that it, we know it affects these species now, how long before we find out it's affecting. That's, that's my, more yeah, species. to be, to be honest, that's my big concern with it is uh, a lot of the time some people in this hobby keep stuff. Um, I'm, I'm a weird example because my my collection's pretty everywhere. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, yeah, a lot of people, they're like, oh, I like desert species, right? Yes. That's like, they get into desert species. So they get a Euromastix, they get a collared lizard, they maybe get a bearded dragon, right? So yeah, it's I think with it being the way it is, it's really important that people know that, right? But it, it's also not something a bearded dragon breeder is going to be screaming from the rooftops for the they, most part yeah so. they don't want people to know about it i guess yeah <laughs> yeah have you ever heard of something called um yellow scale i think i have yeah i i i, I i'm not gonna say i know anything i just think i've heard of it before okay i i i wouldn't i'm not gonna give i'm not gonna talk about it much because I, I don't know anything about it either but i've heard that um uh, it is a similar thing that actually starts or is very uh, contagious in bearded dragons and it affects them as well. And then it can spread to any agamid species. So I guess like, Oh, what? sorry. Uh, that this might be, um, and yeah, yellow be... scale is probably one of the random common names for it. I don't know what the actual name for it is. So it might be, you might know it as, as something else. Yeah. That, I, that does sound, Oh yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. I Googled this cause I'm one of those people that like, yeah, if no I, worries. if I don't know a reptile thing, I'm just like, what? yeah uh okay yeah this was like um this was like the fungus disease right 
That's it. Yes, it's like a. It, it almost looks like the, the, some of the scales are getting a fungus on it, and they yeah, get yes. the rest around it. Yeah, I I don't believe this is this is like its own disease. Okay, but so, yes, this is another bearded dragon. Um, this is another bearded dragon disease. Yeah, uh, okay. I also forgot the um, the bacteria from the mouth also affects agamids. I, I forgot that one off my list. All of them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it said it said ag agamid on it, so okay. I I could go back and I could definitely I'll get you some links for that because I think please it's, do that's very interesting. I th yeah, I think yeah. Because I mean, like I I keep I do keep uh, both uh, similar to you. I have wide like range in my collection. I do keep desert species and I do keep tropical species, but all of my agamids are tropical. So it's like mm. an interesting thing is like, will my desert geckos be able to? catch it probably not but is there a way that you can kind of transfer it to uh, a tropical agamid or something like that just yeah it's 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 very interesting so um is it something that's more recently been a worry in um in captivity or is it something that and, and have you heard of any cases where it's actually affected somebody's collection um in the united states or in canada or anywhere like that uh i've heard stories i haven't i don't know anyone personally okay. affected by it but i've yeah. heard and seen stories uh, horror on, stories you know, yeah yeah horror stories for sure <laughs> um yeah it it's it's been around for a, a good bit like it was very it was known that euromastics i remember uh when i like first started getting into euromastics i i i had heard about it then so okay. it that that knowledge has been around for a while um, as far as the other species, uh, I know the collards is, uh, more of at least new knowledge to me. And it seemed to be the new knowledge to a lot of the other collared people that I talked to. So, um, yeah, that one, it does seem like kind of semi new information. Uh, Euromastics was already known and the other step in between, uh, I'll just be perfectly honest. I'm not too sure. Um, I, I tend to keep my reading to what I keep, um, back to just my whole, I want to make sure I'm doing the best for what I've gotten, not what I'm dreaming of kind of thing. Yeah. So um, I, I always make sure my reading is very uh, based on my animals. So I, I know that it, I knew it affected Euromastics. And then when I saw the collared one, um, it made me even more concerned with it, right? Because I would sure. like to make these guys a little bit more popular than they are. Uh, I think they're amazing pets. Um, I know it's a sad fact, but Beardies live a long time. Collards live a little bit less. So you know, someone who gets one of these when they're, I mean, if I would have got one when I was 18, I could have kept it till I was 28 for sure. Yeah. Right? yeah. So it's like, it's, less, it's not as, I think like it's, it's a, it, it's mildly morbid to think of it that way. Like, oh, this animal doesn't have as long of a lifespan, but you also have to think like it's, it's less it, of a commitment to long term. It's less of a commitment for you. So like, what age are you? What, what, are you, what's your life doing? Right. Like, where are you going with your life? Do you know um, where you, you're going to be in 10 years, 15 years? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And that's the, I think that was why I was willing to take this to kind of the next level of what I was doing. Cause like, I, I kind of slowed down for one season and I was like, life's kind of boring. I don't really, I'm not really having fun anymore. So yeah, I realized how much joy I got out of this. And um, yeah, it just, I think it's really important to like worry about things like this though. Cause if we're not as keepers worried about it, that's how we're all just going to end up with nothing to keep. Yeah, hundred percent, and and not just worry about it, but like you're doing, and like you brought it up to me, bring, create awareness about it, spread it, let everybody it's, know it's, it's it's out there. Yeah, it's gonna lose me sales. People have bearded dragons, and they're gonna go. I don't get a collar now. Yeah, yeah. I can't get a collar, and that's fine. That's fine by me. I don't want the animal to be at risk, and I'm glad that those people. I, I would much. I would be much more. I would be much happier if someone were to say to me, oh, I have a beardy. I can't get one of those. Then, oh, yeah. No, I can bleach that every day for sure. sure like, yeah. I, I don't know, man. It's like, yeah. yeah. So it's 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 good that there's people out there that are doing that. And, and I'm willing I'm willing to do that, too. It's just it's one of those like everyone kind of needs to do their part to make things like that aware to most keepers. Yeah. I think the, the best the best way to summarize that is kind of like better like be better be safe than sorry right like that's yes it's all yeah. it comes down to uh thank you very very much for coming on and doing this and giving us all that awesome information about collared lizards and honestly it was it ended up being a lot more than collared lizards and i couldn't be happier about that it, yeah yeah we, we should have just we should have just talked hobby yeah we should just talk hobby but <laughs> you know what that gives us a chance to bring you on again and do this again um so yeah once again thank you very much for doing this can you let everyone know where they can find you and where they can keep up with all all the latest news with you 
Yeah, for sure. So uh, to see our available animals, which are currently actually just some Chihuahua geckos, because we're kind of in a weird spot of our season right now. Are you? Uh, sorry, I'm gonna I'll stop you real quick. Are you going to be at the December Four Expo? We're we're trying to be right now. I don't want I don't want to commit. We're trying to be. Um, okay. This this is a busy part of the year for um, my other half, and it's really hard to do expos without her. I'll be honest. So, for sure. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. So I. Uh, I, we're, we're trying, but she's very busy right now. So we're, we're going to just see closer to, I don't, I never like to be like, yeah, we're going. Yeah. yeah so yeah. people can find us uh, on topshelfgeckos.ca. That's our website for any of our animals. Uh, it links through to all of our socials as well, but you can find us on Instagram, Top Shelf Geckos, Facebook, Top Shelf Geckos. Uh, and I don't have TikTok or any of that stuff. I'm 35. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I don't want to take that. Okay, well, Top Shelf Geckos everywhere. I'll have all the links in the show notes. Um, go check them out. Give them a follow. And if you're looking for a collared lizard, you know where to go. Um, I do still have some available. Yeah, awesome. Okay, there you go. So go go check them out. Honestly, guys, I like I said earlier, I held them in my hand. Um, I saw how they run up to him. It's, it's like definitely a species that i one day want to start looking into myself they're super super interesting and i um i'm glad you're like you said you're making them more popular and, and you know creating awareness for them yeah i hope i can <laughs> yeah okay well thank you very much once again for coming on um i'm gonna wrap this one up here now i am daffy's reptiles on all social media platforms daffy's roundtable for the podcast thank you for listening and we'll see you on the next one